Hello, I'm Steve Punt. And I'm Hugh Dennis, and thanks for downloading the BBC Radio 4 Friday Night Comedy Podcast. The podcast that is frankly pretty annoyed this week uh, because we found out Barack Obama has been tapping our phones. Although we don't really get many phone calls, so it's not necessarily a huge problem. No, it's the principle, though. Yeah, if anything, it's quite flattering. So, whether you're a former US president or not, please enjoy this week's episode of The Now Show. Do you think he watches outnumbered? <laughs> Hello, I'm Steve Punt. And I'm Hugh Dennis. With us are Kerry Godleman, Pippa Evans, Luke Kempner and Lucy Porter. And this is... The Now Show! And as usual, there were few surprises in the budget. Everybody knew what was going to be in it, possibly because it was deliberately leaked to the press. Well, more likely, Philip Hammond made the mistake of reading it quietly to himself in front of his Samsung smart television. <laughs> the usual rituals followed. Jeremy Corbyn stood up and denounced it on behalf of... People who don't know if they will have jobs next week. <laughs> and the shadow cabinet all nodded knowingly. <laughs> The thing was, there was barely a mention of Brexit. Lots of stuff about how great the economy is, no mention of the fact that in just a week or so we're going to throw out all the bathwater and the baby, and all the plastic ducks, loofers and other bath accessories, and then throw out the bath and all the plumbing and then reinstall it, completely differently and without a B-Day. Because that's from the continent and we never really wanted one in the first place. Britain is just about to begin the political equivalent of having James May dismantle entire economy and then reassemble it from scratch. And there was no mention of this. Instead, there was a rise in national insurance contributions for the self-employed. Meaning that if he is thinking of getting his bathroom done, Phil might want to watch out. All right, Mr Hammond, we finished the grout and then we put the panel on the bath. Oh, and we've plumbed the toilet directly to the shower. <laughs> So every morning you'll get a reminder of what we think of you. <laughs> the papers didn't think much of it either, uh, especially since the move directly broke a manifesto pledge. And national insurance is one of those things that seems boring, but is actually really quite painful. Like Pilates. <laughs> We also know that the Chancellor is planning a £60 billion contingency fund to cover Brexit, because obviously that's what you do when you believe that leaving Europe is a risk-free opportunity to forge new relationships freed from the shackles of Brussels. Now, Philip Hammond supported Remain, and he clearly hasn't been able to go to sleep every night listening to the same self-hypnosis CD as Theresa May, the one that goes... Brexit is a great idea. Nothing can possibly go wrong. It will all be fine. You can absolutely trust Boris Johnson. Well, it's worked for her. I mean, she, she's like a Scientologist now, chanting slogans, screaming abuse at anyone who questions her. But spreadsheet Phil, not so much. He's putting a brave face on it, but a £60 billion contingency fund says he's still not entirely sure about the economic consequences. Well, that plus his renovations at 11 Downing Street. Chancellor, every new occupant of the house adds their own touch. Gordon Brown decorated, George Osborne had the flat at the top altered. Uh, what would you like to do? Uh, the house is fine, thank you. I would, though, like to make a change to the garden. Oh, go on. I want a concrete bunker and enough tins of baked beans to last me for a year and a half. <laughs> We're not saying Hammond isn't confident about Brexit, but you may have noticed in the budget that where they normally say... I commend this budget to the House. He decided on... And may God have mercy on us all. <laughs> The biggest row over spending, though, is over the NHS. I mean, why save £60 billion when supposedly £12 billion would sort out the funding crisis? Apart from anything else, Brexit and Remain are themselves a potential reason for a major restructuring of care. I'm afraid a and &E is at overcapacity. We've had a sudden rush. Hmm, what's the problem? Well, half of them are Remainers, still in shock from the referendum result, and the other half are Brexiteers, hung over after celebrating for nine months solid. And, well, we can't put them together. So, where are they going to go? Simple. Inpatients and outpatients. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm here all week. <laughs> uh, and longer if they don't sort out these waiting lists. <laughs> There's no doubt that the NHS is in crisis, so much so that there is actually a proposal now that health authorities should use Uber to send elderly patients home. <laughs> now, this may reduce bed blocking, although it will introduce a whole new problem 
of car blocking. <laughs> How close is the nearest Uber, darling? Um, oh, uh, four days away. What? Well, an old lady's refusing to get out because it's nice and warm. <laughs> and she's got a bad leg. But maybe this is the solution to a lot of our problems. Defence spending, for example, is mainly a problem because of the massive cost of Trident replacement. So that could be dealt with easily. Uh, Minister, the working group has come up with the proposal for our new intercontinental missile delivery system. Mm -hmm. Uber, sir. <laughs> In the event of a Russian incursion into NATO territory, we simply pop the warhead into the back, drive it as fast as possible to Novizibirsk, and park next to the missile silos. <laughs> And how do we set it off? Oh, the usual dual key system. One key with the driver, and the other with the NHS patient in the back. <laughs> Another cost-cutting measure used in Scotland is to save money on x-rays of children suspected of having swallowed coins by using a metal detector instead. <laughs> which seems a reasonable idea, except why on earth are all these children swallowing coins in the first place? Is Philip Hammond standing there going, Come on, come on, eat up, I'm relying on you all for £10 billion of Brexit contingency. <laughs> <laughs> Children were also the subject of another controversial budget measure aimed at encouraging poorer families to send their offspring to new free schools. They will also get free transport to and from school up to a range of 15 miles, which should fit nicely with the overall strategy. In you get, Sonny. I'm your driver this morning. Sorry it's a bit crowded. You'll have to sit on the missile so we don't get in way of the appendix. <laughs> it's the answer to everything, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Well, I think because we've all been enjoying elections so much recently, here to talk about another one is Lucy Porter. been asked to give a concise yet informative guide to the French presidential elections. I only have what you might call schoolgirl French, but the other cast members have offered to help me. Hugh has a wonderful grasp of French letters and he's always keen to whip out his petit Larousse. <laughs> so the producers have given me all the French newspapers. Um, I've got one here called Le Monde or The World. This one's called Le Parisien or The Parisian. And finally there's this one. Le Figaro. The Fig Roll. <laughs> And I have distilled the basic facts. So here we go, an idiot's guide to the French presidential elections written by an actual idiot. <laughs> French presidential elections are held every five years and they're very different to UK elections because rather than first past the post, they use a two-round voting system. If the French system were in place in this country, it would favour smaller, more radical parties and, I suppose, people who actually speak French, like Eddie Izzard and the cast of Allo Allo. <laughs> The current French president, François Hollande, whose name confusingly means French Netherlands, <laughs> François Hollande is the first ever incumbent not to run for a second term. Although he was incredibly popular when first elected, his fortunes have taken a massive downturn and now his popularity scores are so low he makes Jeremy Corbyn look like Judy Dench. <laughs> there are a few candidates in the running to replace Hollande. They are... Marine Le Pen. Or Seaside the Pen. <laughs> Marine Le Pen is the leader of the far-right National Front Party, or... Front National. Le Pen has portrayed herself as the anti-establishment candidate, every election has to have one these days, who is representing the normal people. This is opposed to the other candidates who are representing abnormal people, people who keep tomato ketchup in the fridge, or who enjoy the nightly show on ITV. <laughs> the daughter of the multi-millionaire five-time presidential candidate Jean-Marie Le Pen, making her just as much of a down-to-earth political outsider as Donald Trump. Le Pen is attempting the difficult political balancing act of making the party more mainstream while not alienating her core demographic of Nazis. <laughs> She is seen as the latest embodiment of the populist movement sweeping the world. If you haven't heard of populism, it's something that sounds harmless but is actually really dangerous, like a puffer fish or an email from a Nigerian prince. <laughs> the next contender is... François Fillon. François Fillon is the centre-right Republican candidate. He was the early favourite but has seen his support tumble because he's being investigated for a possible abuse of public funds. This centres on allegations he paid his wife and his children to work in his office, which may lead to a unique resignation statement. Uh, today I have to announce to you that uh, I'm resigning in order to spend less time with my family. <laughs> is very handsome and looks like a man in an advert who has finally found a hair dye that hides the grey. 
which, given the stress he's under, is quite an achievement. He's also got the most fantastically striking black eyebrows. Apparently, he won them off Alistair Darling in a game of strip poker. <laughs> Another front runner is Emmanuel Macron. Emmanuel Macron. I don't know who she is, but I think my dad was a fan of her films in the 70s. Uh, actually, Lucy, that, that's a man. Well, I've just learned something new about my dad. Um, <laughs> Macron is a classic liberal centrist in the mould of Valérie Giscard d'Estaing, the French Valérie Singleton. <laughs> Macron is married to his high school teacher, who he met when he was 15 and in her class. Oh, a dangerous liaison with a teacher. That is so French. The only thing more French than that is painting a picture of a bidet with a croissant and then throwing it away because it bores you. <laughs> he believes that the third way policies espoused by Tony Blair are the answer to his country's problems, because he's a socially liberal capitalist who presumably hasn't watched the news since about 2003. <laughs> Macron is the current favourite to win. He doesn't believe in traditional definitions of left and right, which is why sat-navs are called tom-toms and not Macrons. <laughs> also in with the chances... Benoit Hamon. Benny the Ham. <laughs> the Socialist Party candidate has been called the French Bernie Sanders and he supports a universal basic income and a tax on robots. He's also in favour of the legalisation of cannabis. Presumably that's why he's so scared of robots. <laughs> Another left-wing hopeful is... Jean-Luc Mélenchon. Jean-Luc Mélenchon is French for John Cougar Mellencamp. <laughs> John Cougar Mellencamp rose to stardom in the 80s with rock classics such as Hurt So Good and Jack and Diane. I don't know so much about Jean-Luc Mélenchon, but he's probably not going to win, so I can't really be bothered. <laughs> so, in conclusion, it's quite hard to talk about this story when I don't know any French, but I reckon right-wing populism may be à la mode, but if enfant terrible Marine Le Pen is envisaging a coup d'état, she may find that the bourgeoisie consider her déclassé. Meanwhile, François Fillon's financial faux pas may have rendered him hors de combat. And while Emmanuel Macron has panache, élan, and a certain je ne sais quoi, does he have the necessary savoir-faire? Benoit Hamon appeals because of his laissez-faire attitude, but the new Nouveau riche will feel comme ci, comme ça about his position on taxation. <laughs> and what do we really know about Jean-Luc Mélenchon? Is he a poseur, a parvenu, and a Jean provocateur? One thing's for certain, at the denouement, the French will have a sense of déjà vu. Or maybe they'll deliver a coup de grâce as they think, vive la différence! There's only one thing I can say for certain, je m'appelle Lucy Porter, j'ai deux ans, et j'aime la musique pop. Au revoir. <laughs> Uh, so President Trump claimed this week that he'd been wiretapped by Barack Obama prior to the US election, drawing parallels with the Watergate break-in, which of course led to the resignation of President Nixon. But what is a wiretap? Does anyone do it now? Nothing has wires? And what else do the security services get up to? To tell us, would you please welcome from the Channel 4 series Spies, now available on all four, intelligence specialist Julian Fisher. <laughs> Hello, Julian. So Donald Trump says he's had his phone tap. That sounds a, a bit sort of 70s. What, what is a wiretap or a phone tap? It does sound a bit Starsky and Hutch, doesn't it? Mm. The language is incredibly dated, um, and it does relate to what actually used to happen when intercepting communications. Nowadays, it doesn't require physical contact with a wire. It doesn't require a tap in the sense of the words that was its basis, but uh, it's done remotely. It's usually done through the exchanges through cooperation with the providers of telecom services. In the surveillance world, Hollywood style, mm. you have a break-in, mm -hmm. then you have a van round the corner <laughs> where there's a bloke with a woolly hat constantly eating Chinese takeaways, <laughs> listening to two massive headphones. Isn't that a TV detective van? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> might well be. So it's not like that anymore. Does that, did that ever happen? All these things may happen. You're talking about covert entry, mobile surveillance. These techniques are used. They're tried, they're trusted. If you want to listen to what's, what's passing between two people in a private room, you may want to install a covert listening device. President Trump definitely used the word tapping. <laughs> it was spelt wrong, as a matter of fact, but he, he, used, <laughs> but he used it. I mean, he seems to imply that the phone was actually tapped. Do you think that sounds even feasible? 
doesn't sound necessary to me. This could be done through remote means. If it's done through government auspices with the cooperation of the telecom services provider, it can be done at the exchange. Yeah. There's no need to go in in a balaclava, Inspector Clouseau style, and, <laughs> and clamp listening devices onto wires anymore. It's a hangover from the terminology used over the years by, well, by Hollywood and, and by intelligence services. But it's, it's, it's been quite, quite fun, though, isn't it? Going in with a hat on. I, I've always enjoyed doing that. It's one of my yeah. favourite activities. <laughs> You know when you're in films, again, which I'm slightly obsessed by, <laughs> when you are tracing a phone call, again in films, you know, you have to keep a person on the line for a certain amount of time so you can home in on where the signal is coming from. Mm, makes great TV, doesn't it? Yeah, but is it true? If it's a mobile telephone, you can more or less instantaneously triangulate where somebody's using it. You talk about the legal use of this. Mm. I mean, how, how difficult is it? How common is it? In the UK, there's a whole raft of laws governing uh, lawful intercept. Everything that is done by the intelligence services in most developed societies is subject to the rule of law, so much so that perhaps it runs the risk almost of leeching the profession of its glamour, except when you're breaking into properties with a balaclava. But do you still... <laughs> well, I don't think he would agree with no, you. He gets no, his no. whole knowledge of it from films. Oh, no, so, 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 <laughs> is any spying like Le Carre? Are there kind of dead letter boxes and do... You see, I always think... If you see two elderly men, middle-aged mm. men, going to sit on the same park bench, <laughs> you just yeah. know that one Top of them's going to pull an envelope yeah. out, leave it there, and the other one's going to walk off with it. And I kind of think, <laughs> surely people know... I think maybe if you've got bench cam mm. to watch every bench in Britain, we could sort all that stuff out. Does that happen? I've personally never used a bench. <laughs> Dead letter box? I don't even know what that is. What is it? Yeah, there have been occasions when I have used a dead letter box, yes. It's, it's very unexciting. It's leaving something somewhere for somebody else to recover. That's just <laughs> like a normal parcel delivery, then, isn't it? That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> You'll find it left in your recycling bin. <laughs> and just lastly, how much do we need to worry about the Internet of Things? In other words, will your toaster spy on you? And what will it find out? <laughs> I would say worry is too strong a word. Being wary is, is more appropriate. I mean, I really don't believe we're now entering some 1984-style life experience, however hard Trump is working to make that the case. But I do feel we have to individually be concerned about the possibility of hostile intrusion into devices, not by government, because let's face it, they just haven't got the resources to conduct mass surveillance on an entire population. But... We have to be concerned about uh, intercept by criminal gangs and criminal individuals because they have access to this software as well. If you are suspicious that your toaster <laughs> is collecting data on you, mm. <laughs> don't stab it with a knife. <laughs> with that sort of mindfulness of these uh, mm, security yeah. issues in mind, uh, we, we'd like to give you a quick security services quiz. Hugh, uh, question well, one, please. The Watergate scandal was, of course, about a break-in at the Democratic campaign headquarters and since then many scandals have been given the suffix mm. gate. So pleb gate was Andrew Mitchell being rude to a policeman, pasty gate Osborne's tax on pasties. Do you know what biscuit gate was? Um, I'm thinking of a game played in a public school that's probably wrong. <laughs> 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 there was a scandal in Mauritius where the daughter of the speaker of the Mauritian parliament was selling biscuits to government departments at inflated prices. <laughs> Shocking. Quite right, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Shocking. Uh, Donald Trump and his wife, Melania, have Secret Service code names which were chosen from a list suggested by the Secret Service. <laughs> so, there are three pairs of names here. Two pairs were rejected. One was chosen for them. So, are Donald and Melania Trump Orangutan and Ocelot? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Genuine which, suggestion, apparently. That which, which way around that be? <laughs> <laughs> are they fake news and fake boobs? <laughs> These are genuine suggestions. Or mogul and muse? Uh, I'm going to say mogul and muse. You are absolutely, absolutely correct. correct. So there you go. Um, thank you very much indeed, Julian Fisher. to reflect on International Women's Day. Uh, I don't know how international she is, but she definitely qualifies as a woman. So please welcome Kerry Godleyman. Hello, this 
This week we celebrated International Women's Day, and that's a day that always catches me out. It's right after Christmas, then there's Valentine's, then my two kids' birthdays, they're in February, then it's the big one, Pancake Day. I've barely got time to get my Happy Women's Day cards out and hang my ironic uterus bunting. <laughs> it turns out there are still corners of our society that didn't get the equality memo. This week there's been a parliamentary inquiry triggered by a petition started by Nicola Thorpe after she was sent home from work for refusing to bind her feet. Sorry, wear high heels. <laughs> the government has said that the dress code imposed on Nicola thought was unlawful. However, the committee's heard that requirements for women to wear high heels at work remains widespread. Of course, no one's suggesting if you want to wear high heels, you shouldn't be prevented from doing so. I'm not saying you shouldn't wear stilettos, Tony. Well, you are. You just said I shouldn't wear them. Well, I've just said, do you think they're practical? Well, I feel that you're not respecting my individual self-expression, mate. Look, that's the last thing I want to do, Tony. It doesn't make me any less capable as a builder. What? <laughs> well, I suppose not. But, but do we need to have a word about your jeans? I can barely see any of your arse crack. <laughs> As always, the core of this issue is choice. People, men and women, should be allowed to wear what they like. Most days, I like to look like the people you see smoking a fag in their pyjamas outside the front of hospitals. <laughs> Keeping up with fashion or worrying about having a sinewy carve are not really a priority for me, but I don't feel compelled to tell other people what to wear. Well, I tell my kids what to wear, but, I mean, if it was up to them, they'd spend every day dressed as Batman or Peppa Pig, and there's only so many wedding photos I'm prepared to ruin. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, I do actually pity blokes that have to wear a suit for work. It really wipes out self-expression. The only opportunity a bloke in a suit gets to express himself is in his tie. All his creativity, all his individualism, all his personality, it has to be funneled into that narrow strip of fabric. And for some blokes, the canvas just isn't big enough, is it? They're forced to spill over into a novelty sock. <laughs> I love music and I love comedy. How am I going to express myself? I know. I'm going to wear my keyboard tie and my South Park socks. Check me. Yeah, yeah, I, I am single. Yeah. <laughs> this feminist fuzzy line between choice and hypocrisy dropped Emma Watson into the news this week, which brilliantly coincided with the release of her new film, Beauty and the Beast, which is a touching story about seeing someone's inner beauty, even if they haven't shaved their forehead. <laughs> It turns out she's evoked the old good feminist versus naughty feminist binary feud by revealing her breasts in Vanity Fair. To be accurate, it wasn't a full breast reveal, right? It was a partial breast reveal. She wore this little sort of garden fence wrapped around her shoulders and she didn't have a bra on. So you didn't see any nipple, but you saw about four twelfths of her breast. I've been doing fractions with my kids for homework this week, so I'm, I'm really, really pleased with that observation. Now, uh, to be honest, I don't really know what all the fuss was about. When I was breastfeeding my children, I was so sleep deprived and laissez-faire about body function, I'd often forget to put my boobs back in. <laughs> you could very frequently see me in the local park pushing a pram topless, swinging freely like lifeboats on the side of the Titanic. <laughs> Emma says feminism is about liberation, choice and equality, and so it is. Wouldn't equality just be fan-dabby-dozy? I'd be over the moon to see equality. What about a little photograph of the editor of Vanity Fair, Graydon Carter, wearing an arty little wire bolero, revealing just four twelfths of his testicles? <laughs> Watson really shouldn't have to put up with this. She's been an amazing ambassador for women's rights and she suffered appalling prejudice for being a muggle. <laughs> but Piers Morgan made time in his very busy schedule reading thousands of abusive tweets from the public to ferret around on the internet and he found some unsisterly comments Emma made about Beyonce in a Beyonce video from 2014. Piers gleefully pounced on Emma's betrayal, calling her a feminist fraud, which is a new term to me. What is a feminist fraud? Is that, is that someone that demands equality for the sexes while secretly twerking dressed as Anne Widdicombe at Spearmint Rhino? <laughs> if Emma Watson perceives those photos as art and she doesn't feel exploited and her breasts don't resemble a spaniel's ears, why not reveal four twelfths of them in Vanity Fair? I know it's very confusing. If you see a marble statue of a naked woman in a museum or a stately home, that's arty. But if you turn up to that same stately home without any clothes on, the National Trust confiscate your membership card. <laughs> But if heels or nudity or even partial nudity becomes expected or demanded, making any woman or man, but mainly women, feel exploited, then we can all agree, come on, that's a bad thing, isn't it? Nudity is much like our reproductive rights. Our bodies are ours, to do with what we will, not needing the permission of a tabloid journalist with all the moral compass of a... 
well, a tabloid journalist. <laughs> Ultimately, we should all be able to wear what we want, and thanks to this being a radio programme, I've been able to deliver this whole section wearing flat shoes with both my boobs inside a cosy onesie. <laughs> Now, we have a woman literally singing for her supper, or at least some of the what's it's in the green room. Please welcome Pippa Evans. Ladies and gentlemen, it's me, Pippa Evans, here to bring comfort to those who say, I can't cope with the state of the world. I'm overwhelmed by the news coverage online, and I know far too much about Kim Kardashian. People, are you feeling inundated with all the demands the world is placing on you? News that rolls for 24 hours And shops that are open for that long too Box sets on Netflix, white hole up to old tricks Facebook updates never stop Charities appealing, causing guilty feelings Cause you'd rather spend your cash on a brand new top Overwhelmed, overwhelmed The budget, Brexit and Trump no wonder we're in such a grumpy grump You talk about going off the grid So no one can get hold of you But you can't resist the beep of your phone And you'd be confused if LinkedIn stopped emailing you A famine's returning, bushfires are burning The income gap is gross and extreme Food banks in crisis, we're frightened of ice and Farage continues to make us scream Overwhelmed, overwhelmed, overwhelmed. overwhelmed. There's too much information About a messed up nation Overwhelmed, overwhelmed, overwhelmed. overwhelmed. Every morning my news feed I dread So on Wednesday, uh, Barcelona overcame seemingly impossible odds to come back from 4-0 down in the first leg and qualify in the Champions League. So we've asked our audience what has been their greatest achievement against all the odds. This is very simple. What's been your greatest achievement against all the odds? I once pushed Mr Blobby over. <laughs> <laughs> I caught a southern rail train and got here today. <laughs> Um, Getting through traffic in fascist pearly. <laughs> <laughs> Running up an overdraft on a deposit account. <laughs> the manager of the Bank of Scotland said it was impossible. <laughs> I showed him. What was your greatest achievement against the odds? Getting tickets for the news quiz. <laughs> Thank you very much. So thank you uh, indeed for those and indeed for listening and goodbye. Goodbye. You've been listening to The Now Show starring Steve Funk, Hugh Dennis, Kerry Godelman, Pippa Evans, Luke Kempner, Lucy Porter and Julian Fisher. It was written by the cast with additional material from Benjamin Partridge, Andy Walton, Ben Hillier, David Mays and Jenny LaVille. The producers were Joe Nunnery and Adnan Ahmed. It was a BBC Studios production.